Okay, our speaker tonight is Ken Roy. Ken is a professional engineer at Oak Ridge, and uh, he's, he's been active and still, still uh, going out to work every day, even though he's, he's uh, gainfully retired, I suspect. And uh, he does a lot of good things. Some of the things he does are totally apart from his professional engineering work. His talk is terraforming and Venus. David, thanks a lot. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, terraforming and if we have time, uh, terraforming Venus and we'll, uh, yeah, we'll see how far we get. Um, okay, next slide. Terraforming uh, literally means earth shaping and you know it's basically the process of turning an uh, inhabitable world uh, into a, a habitable world, something that uh, uh, human life and humans can, can live on. And there's some various definitions there. Uh, next slide. Okay, that's kind of the history of it. Uh, you know, the original concept uh, appeared in 1930. Jack Williamson came up with the, the actual term terraforming in 1942. Uh, a guy by the name of Carl Sagan actually came up with the first terraforming paper. And then the fir first workshop was held uh, when, 76? So, you know, it's a fairly recent discipline. And, you know, looking at uh, things that we can do probably uh, far out in the future. But, uh, you know, just because it's far out doesn't mean it's not un unimportant. Next slide. Okay, this is a, a pretty view. And, you know, if we succeed in our terraforming concepts, uh, this could be uh, an image taken on uh, either Mars or, or Venus, you know, once it's been terraformed. So that's, you know, the picture gives you an idea of, of what the goal is, you know, to, to create Earth-like environments on, on alien worlds. Next. Next slide. Next. And why do we need to go to alien worlds, uh, live on alien worlds, uh, get into space. Um, I guess everyone's heard of black swan events. Yes, no, okay. Yes. Um, the dinosaurs, you know, lived very happily for 150 million years and uh, one day uh, something happened that they had no reason to expect and that's called a, a black swan event and it pretty well wiped them out and the same thing could happen to us so getting uh, humanity out um, among the stars, uh, you know, living on different worlds is, uh, you know, perhaps a good idea, a good concept for our long-term survival. Next slide. Uh, when I start talking about terraforming, one of the questions that I always seem to get is, why do we want to terraform? We can just build space settlements. And, you know, that's a fairly simple question, but uh, the answer is a little bit more complex. Uh, first of all, it's not an either or. We could actually, you know, plan on doing both. <coughs> um, but, you know, they say we can build space settlements. Uh, terraforming, therefore, is unnecessary, difficult, expensive, dangerous, takes way too long. Uh, you run into uh, legal questions. Uh, you know, here's a question to ponder. Who actually owns Mars? Who has the right to terraform it? Uh, who actually owns, uh, you know, planets in different star systems. You know, do we have a, a right to terraform it? Uh, so you run into, um, uh, you know, legal and ethical issues pretty quickly. Uh, okay, next slide. And this is a, an early image of what an O'Neill cylinder would look like uh, from the inside. So Space settlements can, uh, you know, can be pretty, uh, pretty comfortable places to live. Next slide. Uh, here's uh, an image of how you might uh, create a sp space settlement. Uh, you know, just uh, suck the uh, resources and materials off an asteroid, uh, run it through a fabricator, and you can build, uh, you know, almost an unlimited number of uh, uh, space settlements. And this is from uh, an outfit called Space Habs, and if you po poke it around on the internet someday, you know, that's a good, uh, good source to check out. Next slide. And here's uh, a way to push around asteroids uh, to locations where you would want to fabricate uh, space settlements. Next slide. Uh, living in a space settlement can actually be a pretty uh, handy uh, 
pretty nice place to live. And again, the Space Hab people have come up with pretty interesting views of what uh, you know the interior would look like. And you know, it, it's not a, a cheap place. Next slide. Uh, waterfalls, golf courses. You know, it can be very pleasant. Next slide. Yeah, not bad. Okay, next. Uh, get a better view of the golf course. Next slide. Uh, one of the concerns I have about uh, space settlements uh, is space radiation. And, uh, you know, just to take a, a couple of minutes to go through it, uh, the solar wind, uh, you know, generates uh, protons, electrons, alpha particles, uh, gamma, some gamma. And NASA's looked at that pretty closely, and they've concluded that if you, uh, you know, provide shielding, 550 grams per square centimeter, you can, you know, cut down the radiation exposure for the uh, uh, people living on the space settlement to, uh, you know, about half a, half a rim a year. And, you know, by way of background, we get about, you know, 0.4 rim a year just here, here on Earth. So, you know, that, that's, that's pretty, pretty normal. The other source of uh, radiation is cosmic radiation. And, you know, those are, are particles for the most part. Uh, protons, a few heavy ions. And we can screen uh, from most of those if we up the, the shielding to maybe 1,000 um, grams per square centimeter, and, and water's a good shield. But the problem is with uh, cosmic radiation, there's at the tail end of the spectrum, uh, really heavy, really fast particles. Uh, we've measured uh, cosmic radiation you know, here on the surface of the Earth. Uh, they detected one iron atom that had uh, made it all the way to the surface of the earth and they detected it in a cloud chamber and calculated the energy involved and uh, it was equivalent to uh, a baseball going 60 miles an hour. So there's a lot of energy in a, a little bitty particle and our, our conventional understanding of radiation doesn't really account for uh, relativistic heavy ions. Uh, been, there have been studies looking at uh, mice and, and what the this kind of radiation does to them. And yeah, you have one particle, but if it uh, runs through the brain, it can leave tens of thousands of uh, nerve cells dead behind it. Uh, and at least with mice and probably with humans, you're gonna end up with significant cognitive uh, failures. Uh, so shielding from um, this kind of radiation is something new to us. It's probably gonna involve heavy shielding and distance uh, or some combination of the two. We're protected on Earth for the most part because of our atmosphere, um, which again provides uh, you know, a lot of distance and a, a lot of mass. And gamma ray burst, uh, we expect these uh, accounted for several extinction events here on Earth. Uh, very high energy gamma, very intense, and uh, depending on how close you are to the source, uh, you know, you're going to need a lot of shielding. If you're on a planet, at least you have half the planet, or at least half the population has half the planet between them and the, uh, the source, and they might survive. Here on Earth, the uh, ozone layer may not, but uh, that, that's a thought. So space settlements, uh, I think, have some issues, well, and space travel have some issues with uh, radiation exposure as uh, I'm not sure that we've really fully dealt with. Okay, next. Uh, okay, the other objection is we don't need to terraform. We'll just find a, a living world and, and move right on in. Uh, we know planets are pretty common. Uh, we're detecting a lot of hot Jupiters, but you know that's because those are easy to detect. There's probably a lot of Earth-sized worlds out there too. Uh, some people think uh, Earth is pretty or life is pretty common, and, and that could be. Uh, you know, that's an open question. Um, and also, you know, the definitive study on star travel, Star Trek, uh, they couldn't go more than a parsec without stumbling over an M-class planet, so they, they must be very common out there. Uh, and they always spoke English, too. I never understood that. Uh, next. And John Preston gave me this, and uh, so I thought I'd work it in. You know, it illustrates that, uh, that approach. We don't need to terraform, we'll just find what we want. Okay, next. Uh, okay, need to make a little digression to, you know, at least 
make an argument that uh, you know finding a planet that we can move into is, isn't really tenable uh, or may not be tenable. There, there's, there's a lot of unknowns that we're, we're running into. Uh, DNA, Earth DNA, based on uh, four nucleotides. And I'm not going to pretend to pronounce them TC, AG, you know, and they, they form pairs. And that allows uh, the DNA to, uh, to replicate, you know, a pretty elegant system. Uh, okay, next. Okay, forming uh, Earth proteins. Um, again, if you're a biologist, my, my apologies, but I'll, I'll just go through it very quickly. Uh, messenger RNA is created by molecular machines that run up and down the DNA and create messenger RNA, essentially, you know, punch tape that floats around the cell until it's picked up by another uh, molecular machine that uses the instructions on that punch tape to create uh, proteins. And, uh, yeah, there are about 20 amino acids that can be specified uh, you know, on this punch tape and there's a number of stop commands. It's, it, it's pretty interesting, um, you know, way outside my field, but pretty interesting. Of those 20 amino acids, nine are, you've heard of essential uh, amino acids. Well, those are acids uh, that you can't make in your body. You have to ingest them. Uh, if you don't ingest them, you, you starve to death, even though you have all the food you want. If you don't have the proper amino acids, uh, you know, a long, slow death. Okay, next. Uh, again, proteins are, are what we make out of amino acids. Uh, they're the molecular machinery within a cell, the structure within the cell. You know, they're, they're just critical to, to life. And earth uh, proteins are based out of uh, 20 or 23. I'm not quite sure how the other three amino acids get in there. I think that's uh, the mitochondrial DNA. Linda, that right? No? No? Or you don't know? Okay. So 20, 23 amino acids um, are, are what we're all, all built of. Uh, but there's 500 of those things out there. So, you know, one could argue that it's just luck that, uh, you know, when life evolved on, on Earth, uh, that we picked those particular uh, nucleotides and those particular uh, amino acids. Uh, okay, next. Alien proteins, on the other hand, aren't necessarily restricted to those amino acids, and they could have uh, a DNA system, you know, very different from uh, what we have, or may not even have DNA. But if they're built on amino acids different from what we have, uh, there's going to be an incompatibility. You know, we may not be able to eat them, they may not be able to eat us, although they might try. Um, and what's interesting, in doing some research for this, there was a, an organization or a research group in California that came up with uh, two new letters and stuck it into a DNA for a bacteria. So that DNA had six letters. And it's, uh, last I heard, it was stable over 20 generations. So uh, there doesn't seem to be anything magical about the four nucleotides that make up our DNA. There, there could be others. Uh, okay. Um, if we uh, landed on a planet that evolved, you know, completely apart from, from Earth, um, we're pr probably going to be immune, you know, to its uh, viruses and, and parasites. Uh, toxins and allergens, you know, that could be a different story. You know, if, if it turns out we, we land on an implast planet and uh, the life is, uh, you know, based on Earth life, Earth DNA and our amino acids, then uh, I think they're questions that we need to ask. Uh, but anyway, if we land on a, an alien world, uh, the life may not have, uh, you know, the essential amino acids that, uh, that we need. And also, you know, this uh, toxin uh, and allergen problem work, works both ways. You know, it'd be a shame to, you know, land on a world and open the door and walk into paradise and then have everything you breathe on die. Uh, and one question I don't know, uh, it, what happens if you ingest lots of uh, alien uh, amino acids? Is, is that going to uh, result in bad things? You know, that's an unknown. Okay, so the top world is, is Earth. Uh, the world on the right is uh, a living world, what we've been talking about. It's, uh, you know, say it evolved uh, separately around a, an alien star. And the one on the left is uh, a barren dry world. Uh, I, I guess I would argue that the, the one on the left is the one that we should uh, aim to, to colonize, and the only way we can colonize it is to uh, terraform.
the one on the right, I think you run into uh, safety and ethical issues that uh, you know certainly need to be thought about. Next. Uh, okay, terraforming in, uh, what do we have, seven easy steps. Uh, I guess the first step, you know, you, you want to know what you're, you're dealing with, so you survey the planet very thoroughly, make sure that there's no, no life on it that uh, may get you into trouble. That's been the, the plot of several Star Trek and, and other alien or, or other Siffy movies that I've, I've seen. You, you're terraforming the world and all of a sudden you find out, oh, there's life. Well, you want to know if there's life on the world before you start terraforming it. Uh, and the second step, uh, oddly enough, is to hit it with a big rock if you want to adjust its uh, orbit or uh, a spin rate. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then hit it with smaller rocks to kind of sculpt the surface to something that, uh, you know, we may find more desirable. And four, five, and six, you know, can be done in parallel. Uh, adjust the temperature and pressure of the atmosphere, adjust the composition of the atmosphere, and import water for the oceans. And then the final step, of course, is to import uh, Earth life. And again, one of the big advantages of terraforming is you have the life uh, that you want. You, you import Earth life, so it's going to be, you know, uh, it's going to be agreeable to, uh, to us. And you, well, here's an interesting ethical question. You know, could you leave out certain uh, life forms like mosquitoes and fleas and ticks and poison ivy? Uh, I guess that's a, a choice to ponder. Okay, next. Okay, this is the water, yeah, water phase diagram and shows where Earth is. And up in the right you have Venus, uh, you know, you have Mars, Titan, and it, it shows you where, you know, how Earth is and, and, and how the different temperatures and pressures vary. Uh, next step, or next slide. So to terraform Mars, you have to increase pressure and increase temperature. Uh, to terraform Venus, you have to decrease temperature and de decrease pressure to bring it within, you know, Earth normal conditions. Next. And this is what uh, the atmosphere we're uh, accustomed to breathing is. Uh, humans don't really need nitrogen, but uh, plants seem to, to need nitrogen. So we really can't leave that out. Oxygen is pretty important to us. Argon, as near as I can tell, is, uh, you know, pretty inert, pretty pointless, so you could probably substitute uh, nitrogen for that. And a little bit of CO2. Uh, that little bit of CO2 is very important. Uh, without CO2, all your plants die. And once all your plants die, the, the animals die. And once those, those are gone, we go. So, you know, CO2 may be a problem in big quantities, but uh, if you don't have any, you have, you have other problems to worry about. Okay, next. Uh, it was the first plan to figure out that you could take water and CO2 and photons and create uh, uh, carbohydrates and O2. O2 is a waste product that it just releases to the atmosphere. Uh, plants, you know, they're not very efficient. They're efficient enough, uh, three to six percent. Uh, they absorb uh, a lot of energy, 130 terawatts currently here on Earth. Uh, you know, so don't discount the plants. And they absorb a lot of uh, carbon, uh, you know, 100 billion tons. Uh, I think that's per year. And, you know, the creation of the cyanobacteria resulted in the great oxygen catastrophe uh, 200 million years later. Um, it destroyed most of the anaerobic life. Uh, the O2 re reacted with uh, the methane in the atmosphere of the time. Uh, losing methane is, methane's a grand greenhouse gas. If you lose that, uh, <coughs> the earth cools. And that happened and we ended up with uh, Huronian glaciation, uh, sometimes known as snowball earth. And that lasted for a good 300 million years until the volcanoes were able to pump out enough CO2 to uh, warm up the planet to, to, you know, get us going again. So again, CO2 seems to be fairly important. And cyanobacteria is that green stuff there on the right. Uh, photosynthesis, uh, you know, comes in really two flavors, you know, very similar. And they need light in the, the blue and red uh, range to, to function. Notice they're not very efficient with green, and that's why plants are green. Because that's the one uh, flavor of light that they just don't really like. So it's reflected away. Uh, next. Okay, complex uh, slide that explains global warming. Uh, yeah, let's skip that. And food, 
web, uh, soil, dirt. If you go outside and uh, pick up a handful of dirt, uh, you're holding uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, uh, maybe millions of little critters in, in your hand, all of whom uh, are part of a fairly complex ecology. And if you're going to terraform a world, you know, think of the challenge. You are going to start with uh, sterile regolith, a sterile soil, and you're going to have to introduce earth life, you know, those hundred thousand million uh, little critters in, in dirt have got to be uh, you've got to you know create living soil from dead soil and again that, that's not a trivial problem uh, but it's probably solvable and again I won't go into the complexity of the ecology of dirt but uh, hey it, it matters. Okay next uh, just one of the cycles to, to keep in mind, uh, one of many, and, and just, just illustrates how all, all this stuff works. We start with plant waste and animal waste, which is, uh, you know, contains proteins. Bacteria uh, eats the protein and creates ammonia. You know, if you smell ammonia, that means proteins are being broken down. And other bacteria converts it into nitrites and nitrates, and then the nitrates are picked up by the plant, and, uh, and so the cycle uh, continues. But if you're going to terraform, you've got to start the cycle somewhere. And how, how do you get it going? Uh, you know, that's, that's a challenging question. And uh, again, not to trivialize the, the problem, but it, it, it's there. We have a question. Yeah, Roy. Um, I don't know anything about this, but I've been told that nitrogen fixing bacteria rely heavily on lightning. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, um, the nitrogen gets into the cycle by nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and they're nitrogen-fixing plants. But most of the nitrogen in the cycle is, is in the cycle. Now, now, some, of course, gets, gets lost, uh, and it has to be replenished by, you know, people who put, or things that put nitrogen back, uh, back in the cycle. Okay, next. Uh, plate tectonics, kind of interesting. Uh, the Earth has them. Mars doesn't, and uh, Venus doesn't, and the current thinking is that uh, that explains why uh, Earth has a magnetic field and Venus and Mars have very marginal, if any, magnetic fields. Uh, plate tectonics uh, means that uh, the planet has an efficient way to get rid of heat that allows uh, movement of the core, uh, planetary core, which creates a uh, magnetic field. But if there's no plate tectonics, uh, there's really no easy way for the, the uh, planet to get rid of heat, so the core, you know, stops moving and the magnetic field, field dies out. So if you're going to terraform, you, you've got to be aware of what's going on inside the planet. Does it have a magnetic field? And again, getting back to CO2, uh, again, there are lots of cycles involved here. Uh, carbonates, uh, you know, formed on land and get washed out to sea. They lay on the sea bottom and eventually get uh, subducted uh, back into the core where they're heated up uh, and pressurized. Uh, breaking down, the CO2 is released and escapes through volcanoes. So again, remember the great oxygen catastrophe uh, of some time ago. It was this cycle that got us out of it, and that's where the CO2 came from plate tectonics. Okay, next. Uh, okay, a big open question, and if anyone has any light on the uh, issue, I'd certainly be you know, glad to talk to them. Uh, we've all evolved uh, in one gravity, you know, here, here on Earth. We have a fair amount of experience of uh, zero gravity, microgravity, because of the International Space Station. Uh, but the effects on humans uh, are pretty, pretty tough. Uh, one researcher, you know, I was looking at said, hey, you know, all, all these effects of, of weightlessness on, on the human body, in effect, mimic, mimic accelerated aging. You know, bones get weak, muscles get weak, hearing goes, eyes go. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're not good at, at zero gravity. Uh, but we don't really have any experience with uh, low gravity environments, you know, the, like you would find on Mars or, or, or the Moon. So the question is, uh, how low can you lower gravity before humans uh, are not able to function effectively, or not able to reproduce, uh, you know, begin to run into to health problems? And I, I don't know the answer. Uh, I'm not sure that we will know the answer until we actually get out there and start experimenting. 
So that's an open question. Uh, next. Okay, we're, that's terraforming in a, in a couple of nutshells, uh, some of the issues that we have got to uh, contend with. So if we have time, let's uh, terraform Venus. And again, I think Venus is interesting because it, it's, you know, effectively Earth's little sister. Uh, you know, mass, uh, escape velocity, gravity, you know, pretty similar to Earth. Has no magnetic field like we talked about before. Uh, axial tilt, something really big hit it sometime in the past and uh, f effectively flipped it on its side, um, or flipped it on its head. Uh, or you can look at it, uh, you know, it's slightly tilted three degrees, it just spins in the wrong direction. Uh, the year, 225 Earth days, but the day is uh, 116 Earth days, so it, it spins very slowly. And, you know, earlier I said we need to be able to spin up a planet. Well, this is, you know, this is a good candidate for it. Mars, uh, you know, has a, uh, a day cycle very close to uh, Earth, so you won't, wouldn't have to worry about spinning it up. Uh, okay, next. Okay, so for Venus, yeah, shorten the day, uh, build ocean basins. It turns out that uh, because Mars hasn't really had plate, tectoni plate tectonics in a long time, uh, that it's relatively flat except for some big volcanoes. So if you imported an ocean uh, and terraformed it, you would end up with a, a, effectively a planet-wide shallow ocean and a few big islands. So we would want to, to you know, shape the, the surface a little bit. Build ocean basins, uh, build mountains, continents. Uh, Got to reduce the atmospheric pressure. The atmospheric pressure on Venus at the surface is about 95 atmospheres, 95 times that of Earth. And what's interesting, um, Venus actually has a lot of nitrogen. It's got about three atmospheres of uh, pressure of nitrogen. So in addition to getting rid of a lot of CO2, you're going to have to get rid of a lot of nitrogen to make it livable. Uh, it's pretty hot, so yeah, that's an issue. Uh, gotta, you know, again, get rid of CO2, get rid of nitrogen, import water and oxygen. Okay, next. Okay, spinning up a planet, that's an exercise in angular momentum. I won't go through the equations here, uh, but it turns out if you have an impactor, you know, typical asteroid, 170 kilometers in diameter, you know, if you hit it at the right point, you can shorten or lengthen the day by 1.4 Earth days. So if you have 82 such impactors, you can, you know, spin up the planet so that its day, day cycle is pretty close to what Earth is. And also, with these big impactors, you can uh, shape the surface, you can deliver water, you can deliver uh, silicates, hydrogen, uh, also big explosions, so you might be able to blast off a fair amount of uh, atmosphere just in the course of shaping the, uh, the surface. Next. Okay, Paul Birch. Uh, this is a published paper, peer-reviewed paper from, uh, I guess, the late 90s uh, in uh, the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society. He, he came up with an approach to uh, terraform Venus. And he said, build a big sunshade at the Venus Sun L1 point. Is everyone familiar with the L1 point or what the L1 point is? Okay, I'll, I'll go over that here in a little bit. Uh, but anyway, it, it's building a big shade uh, in a position that's fairly stable between the Sun and Venus. So you block out all the Sun that would otherwise hit Venus. Uh, and because you've blocked out all the sun, he says it cools uh, five degrees per year. Uh, I suspect that's a little optimistic. Uh, but anyway, if it's five degrees per year, then in 100 years you're close to zero, and another 100 years, you know, CO2 begins to settle out in, in the liquid form. And at that point, you export or bury the CO2, import water, release oxygen, and open up the shun, sun's shade, and, and you're, you're home free. Um, I say import Earth life, again, we've talked about some of the complexities, you know, that may actually be the more challenging part of uh, terraforming, but uh, uh, it's probably solvable. Okay, the L1 point, uh, you know, assume the big white dot is the Sun and assume the planet is, is Venus, then there's a point between those two that's uh, effectively stable uh, with a little bit of effort. 
And you've heard of the L4 and L5 points. Uh, those are also there. Th those are very stable. W once you're at the L4 or L5 point, uh, it's going to take an effort to, uh, to move away. The L1 point is not quite as stable. It takes a little bit of effort to stay there, but it doesn't take much. It's kind of like being on a hill. Once you start rolling off, it takes more and more energy to get back to the top. Uh, but the L1 point is a, a convenient place to park things so that you block the sun that would otherwise hit the planet. Um, and could be very useful uh, in terraforming. Because uh, v Venus doesn't have a magnetic field, that's probably where you would want to put some giant magnets to protect it from uh, the solar wind and, and other uh, particles that come from the sun. Next. Uh, one of the crazy ideas that uh, David and, and Robert and I have worked on is putting a solar shade at the uh, Sun-Earth L1 point. You know, a small one to uh, reduce the sunlight just enough to, you know, counter global warming. And this is what uh, one image might look like. And because you have solar, effectively solar sails at the uh, L1 point, if you converted those to solar cells, uh, to convert uh, the light into energy, you know, and mean to the Earth, you could actually get a lot of energy. And, and that's, again, that's one of the schemes we, we can talk about it later if you like. Okay, next. Uh, at least in that case, you know, it's a fairly small. That's what the shade would look like relative to, uh, to Earth. Now, in the case of Venus, uh, the sun shade would be actually bigger than the planet, so it's a, a fairly massive structure. Next. Okay, next. Uh, Ober Fogg, uh, Marty Fogg, uh, you know, came up with another terraforming approach uh, to Venus. And you start out with, uh, you know, present atmosphere of CO2 and nitrogen. And next. And then you seed it with, uh, you know, modified cyanobacteria and water and hydrogen. And this uh, initiates a reaction uh, that eventually, you know, converts all the CO2 to uh, carbon laying on the surface of the uh, the planet and water and nitrogen and oxygen. Now again, you, you, you have more nitrogen than they need, so part of this uh, effort's gonna have to involve taking the excess, excess nitrogen away. Um, next, at that point, again, you resort to the sunshade at the uh, Sun-Venus L1 point, and that results in cooling, the atmosphere cools off, uh, the water rains and fills up your ocean basins. And next, and final atmosphere, nitrogen, oxygen, a little bit of CO2, uh, you have oceans. Uh, you've also got a lot of carbon laying on the surface uh, that you would have to deal with. But uh, someone else came up with an idea for that. Next. Uh, yeah, in his paper he said he needs uh, four times 10 to the 19th kilograms of hydrogen to, you know, make that uh, reaction work. Uh, that results in a 100 meter thick layer of carbon laying on the, the surface of the, the planet. Now, if you are really good at genetic engineering, maybe that uh, carbon could be in the form of little diamonds, which uh, might make the place interesting. Uh, another guy came up with a modification for that. He said, let's import some uh, calcium and magnesium from uh, mercury, and we can make uh, carbonates out of those. And the carbonates uh, then reduce the amount of hydrogen you need, and the carbonates also are a lot more stable uh, and, and perhaps even useful. Um, and he said, you know, hey, this will take, you know, 10,000 to a million years to, uh, to do. So if you're going to think in terms of terraforming, it's got to be a long-term project. Now, you can always wave your arms and say, well, we will have advanced technology then. We can probably shorten the time. And there's probably some truth to that. But based on what we know now, it will take some time. Next. Uh, just an excursion, four times 10 to the 19th kilograms of hydrogen. That, that's a lot of hydrogen. Um, one way to think of it, if you had a cargo sphere four kilometers in diameter that you filled up with liquid hydrogen uh, and built a tanker around that so you can move materials around the solar system, you would only need 16, 17 million such tankers. So again, to quantify the level of effort that this would require gives you some idea. Uh, okay, next. So terraforming requires energy, time, technology, commitment, perhaps artificial intelligences, and that's a, a question. Uh, trust and a spacefaring civilization with a, a long view. Um, 
I don't know that uh, humanity is ever committed to a project that uh, requires you know a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years to uh, complete. And you know what kind of civilization would be able to make that kind of commitment? Uh, you know that's that's a question. Okay, next. Uh, uh, the Russians always seem to get it first. Uh, in 1971, they published a paper and pointed out the fact that on Venus, you know, the current Venus we have today, uh, if you go up, uh, I think it's 50, 60 kilometers, you reach a point in the atmosphere where the temperature and pressure of uh, the CO2 is very Earth-like. So if you build a big metal sphere and fill it with oxygen, nitrogen, which is lighter than CO2, you've effectively got a zeppelin which will float at that uh, altitude. So the Russian proposal is to build floating cities, uh, you know, based on the zeppelin principle. And uh, recently Gregory Landis has, you know, been pushing that idea. I think he came up with it uh, independently. And, you know, something very similar. So it is possible to have uh, cities and colonies on Mars uh, without colonizing or without uh, terraforming. And there on the right is uh, another image of uh, a cloud city that uh, some of you may recognize. So, okay, next. And here's what uh, an artist visualized that Venus might actually look like if we terraformed it. And next. The future can be you know, a pretty grand thing. Uh, you know, we could have descendants living in very uh, advanced cities uh, on foreign worlds if we're willing to, you know, make the commitment uh, to make it happen. And finally, you know, we won't find any planets with a big sign on them, but uh, I think we have to be selective about the planets we, we do choose. Again, to avoid ethical and, and safety issues, but if a world is, uh, you know, a sterile world, you know, is there really an ethical problem with uh, terraforming it? And I guess that's all I've got. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's, really, uh, that's really a really nice overview. It seems like what we should be doing is, is having some uh, small biospheres and just check out our ideas. Let's say we. And they won't work. We know they won't work, but we learn from our experiences. Is anyone doing this? A little bit of genetic engineering? Well, you had the biodome experiment, um, but they wanted to see if they could create a, a stable ecology. That they didn't start out with uh, sterile dirt. Um, so, yeah, to answer your question, no, I, I don't think anyone is uh, doing the basic research that we, we need to need to do. But there are things that we can do today. You know, like take sterile uh, soil. A simulant for maybe the lunar regolith and see what's necessary to turn that into a living soil that uh, can grow uh, grass and tomatoes. Uh, you know, that's, if anyone's interested in a, you know, science project that they can do today, there it is. Okay, I, I can't see real well here. Any other questions? What I'm thinking of doing, you know, we talked about the L1 point, is setting up a giant magnet at that, uh, at that point. And you can use uh, light from the sun to power it. And this giant magnet then would deflect uh, the particles from the sun and protect um, the atmosphere and also uh, eliminate uh, the radiation problem with uh, uh, lack of a radiation uh, belt. So that would be my solution. But, uh, you know, you could also wrap the planet with a, a giant magnetic uh, uh, coil and, and do it that way. So there, there's different approaches, but it will require uh, a technological fix. Do you have any idea when we could get some Mars dirt to start experimenting with it? You'll, you'll have to ask someone from NASA on, on that. I, I know there are lots of people that want to bring some back, and, and I think that'd be great. But we have a pretty good, pretty good idea of what the Martian soil is. Uh, one thing uh, I think that uh, has surprised people is there's uh, perchlorates in the, uh, the Martian soil. Perchlorates is, is very toxic to, to humans, you know, once it's a very fine dust. 
So the explorers, the first settlers tramping around Mars are going to have some issues to, to deal with. Okay. Yes, sir. Venus is called Earth's twin. Earth so, has a nickel iron core that's hot. Yep. Okay. But what happens to the core of Venus if you spin it up? Will it not generate a magnetic field at that point? Maybe. You know, but that's one of those experiments you're probably going to have to run to find out. And also by, you know, hitting uh, the planet with a big rock, would you uh, re reinitiate the uh, uh, tectonic plates? You know, that's, that's another question. Uh, possible. Uh, but again, we're talking about experiments that are just so big that they've never been run. So, entirely possible. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about how, what, what are you thinking about a, to control a 170-some kilometer rock? I mean, the, the, the 10-kilometer rock is an extinction-level event for us right now, the size of Everest. So, how do you, how do you visualize us lassoing and controlling something even much bigger? Remember that slide where I said trust? We had to have trust. Um, but, but yeah, no, that's, that's a very, very good point. Uh, people who are, are terraforming a world, you know, have material and, and energy uh, resources that they could use to, you know, exterminate uh, life on Earth if, if they so chose. Uh, and yeah, moving asteroids around, uh, again, we, we know how to move mass around, it's just, you know, we have to scale up the, the motors and, and the rockets to, to do that. If you're impacting Venus to a point where you're getting through its atmosphere and actually hitting the ground, enough to actually start spinning the planet up with big rocks. Those are mass accelerators, mass drivers. And you'll be knocking debris off of Venus that will start sky looting all over the place around the solar system. What do you do to keep that from re-impacting Earth and other bodies? Yeah, that's actually a good question. Now keep in mind, uh, you know, you got a really thick atmosphere that's going to, uh, you know, slow down anything, uh, you know, projected from the surface. But yeah, there could be debris, and one of the advantages of using the big rock approach is you can blast a lot of the atmosphere into uh, to space, you know, and, and reduce part of your problem about getting rid of nitrogen and uh, CO2. The atmosphere won't hurt us, but the rocks that come off of Venus could very well cause problems. Okay, so that's a little detail that might have to be worked out, yeah. Uh, John there in the back? Yeah. How, how you, you hit it with a big rock. Glancing blow. Yeah, one of the parameters is, well, we don't have a good, a good. It would be like taking a basketball, putting it on, spinning it up by hitting it with, with rapid fire BBs. Yeah, so you, you want to hit the edge, uh, you know, as tangential as, as you can, can get to it. The closer you come to the center, uh, the less effective you are. But again, it, it's an exercise in angular momentum. If anyone's interested in a physics project, uh, that might be one to think about. Uh, David. I think we've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of benefits of doing that. If we can divert some of the near Earth, Earth's orbit crossing asteroids, which are really threatening us in the long term, we can get rid of those and starts to spin up Venus with some good effects. But well, it, it's still a problem. But we've got a lot of solar energy working on work a lot of time. And you also don't have an infinite supply of asteroids if you use them all up. Um, you know, that's not necessarily a good thing too. And then you run into legal questions. Who, who owns uh, this asteroid? And, and can I use it to spin up my planet? Or are you the guy who wants to mine it for uh, gold and uh, platinum? So, you know, but if you go out uh, to the Oort cloud, you might be able to use uh, comets. And, and again, that would be, you know, there are lots of comets in the Oort cloud. We're thinking, uh, you know, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of, uh, you know, pretty big ice balls out there. So maybe use ice balls uh, as opposed to asteroids. <coughs> yes, sir. What kind of time frame are you thinking that this would take to terraform a planet? At this point, uh, you know, without a lot more knowledge, uh, it, it's going to be, 
you know, just a guesstimate. And we're looking at the minimum centuries and probably more likely uh, millennia, you know, from start to finish. Yeah, and again, the, the question of importing Earth life, you know, I, I just kind of tried to, you know, bring up some of the complexities of, of that. But it's, it's going to be, that is going to be a challenging project into itself. Just how, how do you bring, uh, you know, all these little critters and infect the dirt and, uh, you know, create all these, uh, uh, these ecology cycles that, uh, you know, make everything go and, and start from nothing. Uh, you know, that's not a trivial problem, and that may take as long as, uh, you know, getting rid of the atmospheres. You know, again, that may take a millennia or two. Uh, the sequoias, you know, the redwoods, you know, the, the, those are wonderful trees, uh, but some of those are 500 years old. So if you wanted to grow a redwood forest, you know, that's 500 years, 1,000 years right there. So... You know, again, not a trivial problem, but at the end of the day, you've got a, a habitable world for humanity, and, you know, that can last uh, millions of years. Okay. Sir. I don't understand why we have to make impact. Couldn't we have a large enough body to simply get close enough to these and let the gravity Yeah, I use the yeah uh, you know I, I use the big rock uh, uh, description you know, because I, I think that's pretty clear on how you could uh, you know spin up a, a body that way. Uh, it's certainly possible to do it in, in less violent ways. Uh, you, you could set up a mass uh, driver on the surface and just uh, you know throw out uh, you know masses, small masses continuously and, and until you got up to the. Uh, you know, spin rate uh, that you wanted. And you can also, you know, as you said, you know, put another big mass uh, to circle the world to begin to spin it up uh, or <coughs> use jets or, you know, maybe ad advanced technologies that we can't envision. Uh, but yeah, th there are alternatives to the, the big rock approach. We could use Venus's atmosphere and get rid of some of it as its own mass driver. That's right. That's right. Would you also need a, an artificial moon? If you wanted tides, um, you know, with Venus, you, you don't really have a moon. So the oceans, uh, the only tides would be solar tides, and, and, you know, that would be pretty minor. Now, if you wanted to terraform Mercury, uh, the solar tides would be horrendous. Well, the solar tides would be stronger on Venus. The problem is if you're going to use Earth light, Earth is adapted to having a moon. We are adapted to the lunar cycle of our moon, and all life on this planet is affected by it. So if you're going to grow a colony of Earth stuff on Venus, it'll either have to adapt rapidly to no moon, or we've got to give it one. And does it have to be a full moon, or can it be just, uh, you know, a fake moon, that, you know, a big uh, mylar balloon that uh, orbits? Is, is it the light or is it the gravity from the moon that affects uh, Earth life? We, we don't really know. Uh, so, again, the, the, the gravity question is an unknown and the effect of the moon is an unknown. It may be that, uh, you know, humans can adapt very easily to low gravity environments and maybe we adapt very easily to planets that don't have moons. Uh, don't know. In the case of the dung beetle, it's the light. It's some fantastic experiments were done in an observatory with the uh, duplicating the sky and the lunar light, and the bugs were responding to the light, not to the gravity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it may be light, in which case we could put up a fake balloon to uh, simulate the moon, and, and maybe that's just more comforting to people, too. So, okay, good thought. Sir? I mean, like you said earlier about uh, terraforming actual space colonies, wouldn't it be possible to make the moon out of some reflecting material and still have two different Are we talking about Earth Moon? Earth? I mean, like a simulating Earth Moon on like Venus. Could you still make like a colony, like you were saying? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you're talking about a, a space settlement um, that would also 
play the part of being a, an artificial moon. Yeah, 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 you, I don't see any reason you, you couldn't do that. Uh, so, yeah, our ancestors are going to have a lot of, our ancestors, our descendants are going to have a lot of options. Okay. David? Um, I sometimes get interested in growing plants, and some of them like lettuce, they're just great. They're really easy. Some of them like uh, polonium, when I started growing polonium. Uh, they're so susceptible to uh, dabbing off to the fungi in the soil, they won't grow in regular soil. It has to be uh, mm -hmm. freshly uncovered soil. So you see them around highway cuts. Uh, so I said, well, I'll, I'll generate some. I'll, I'll, I'll get the, the living parts out of it. And I heated it. And it just wasn't regular soil. Water would not be So when you start playing around with these things, you start learning about them. Oh, that's right. That's right. And the sequoias uh, require a very specific uh, climate to, to grow. Yeah. If you get too far inland or too far close to the ocean, yeah, they, they don't grow. So. Have these experiments being done? Should we be, we being Orion, TBIW, should we be trying to stimulate them by giving prizes at science fairs for people who do science fair projects involved with stimulating life? I think that's a good idea. We'll have to discuss that further. Okay, here in the back. Last thing, uh, when you're talking about terraforming other worlds, again, we're talking about moving Earth life there. And we have not just a very complex biological system, we have a very complex mineral system. Mm -hmm. We have to have certain trace elements in mm -hmm. our diet every day that if we go to a deserted island and we don't find them, we can die just as dead from a lack of magnesium or a lack of other trace elements that may be missing in our diet if the soil of Venus doesn't have those same amounts of trace elements, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to have to import them. Uh, and, and yeah, the objective is to, to make the, the soil of Venus or Mars or any world that we're terraforming as, uh, well, it's going to have to be Earth-like enough to support Earth life. Yeah. Now, if we need magnesium, you know, we can go to, uh, you know, an asteroid, get it, and, you know, rain it down on the, the planet. So, as long as we recognize that we need it, uh, we can probably go get it. The problem would be, probably the first time around, we'll find out the hard way that, oh, yeah, we need that stuff. Yeah. Um, but until you run the experiment, you won't really know. Okay. Let me ask one question of the audience here. If we're going to terraform a world and we're deciding, do we import mosquitoes or not? Who would vote for importing the mosquitoes? Okay, one, two. You, you <laughs> who, who would vote for leaving them out? Yeah. <laughs> They're currently absolutely essential to our economy, our biology. Bats eat them for one thing, by the billions, trillions. Yeah, but life is pretty adaptable. Don't you think they'd find something else to eat? <laughs> well, yeah, and, and, you know, um... How do you keep the cockroaches out? Well, you don't bring them. That's right. uh, I'm not sure they do anything good for me. I'd, I'd be happy to leave them. But, again, you're talking about a fairly complex uh, problem, and I'm not sure that I have the answer. But hopefully by the time we're able to, you know, move this kind of quantity of... Uh, material around the solar system, we will have some of these answers. But, uh, you know, right now I, I don't see any showstoppers other than just uh, the scale of the project. Thank you very much. Thank you.